I got some good help. The drug treatment system uh, is in evolution. Uh, I'm around long enough to see that evolution. A number of you may be, but I don't think so. And, um, you know, and where I mark it from, in the U I'm from New York in the USA, where I mark this from, in terms of the evolution of the system, is, is in 19, 1960s when we had a major heroin epidemic in the United States, particularly the urban areas. That gradually spread to other, other areas of the world. And it was really in the 60s that we see the launching of what is what we now call the drug treatment system. And But it had a very, very kind of lurching launch, and that is uh, because it was mainly heroin then that was scaring everybody because it was crime on the streets and so on. And there were no treatments, and that was for heroin addiction, and that was captured in the phrase that you can probably finish, once a junkie, yeah, and that was the, pretty much the phrase. Yeah. The view of addiction, at least opiate addiction, was that that once once you were an addict, it was to a very great extent all over. You know, what I mean, and that is that you were, your, your your life would not change significantly. Everybody believed that. The medical profession, the mental health profession, the public, the corrections people, and the addict. So under that kind of pressure, with a kind of massive heroin addiction epidemic, um, there was a, a compulsion to get something out on the street. So it was not only the correctional system doing what it was doing, which is beginning to criminalize more and more, but basically to try to see what would be available in the way of treatment. The classical kind of psychotherapy to a very great extent, fail with addiction. Uh, there are writings, and for you, those of you that are interested in the scholarship of this, there are writings of, in the 30s and 40s of some very great, great psychoanalytic, psychodynamic, psychotherapists who were trying to deal with addiction. But they were doing a one-on-one -on -one model, you know what I mean, and, and with active addicts who could pay for that treatment, so you already know that it was a kind of subset of addicts able to be seen by psychotherapists because the rest of them couldn't afford it. But even among those, those that subset, uh, they would go session after session and, and, and the, the net net of that is that there was simply no evidence that psychotherapy would, would be effective with addicts or with an active addiction. And even if, even if it could, this has relevance today because we think of counseling and one-on-one -on -one and what's the relevance of one-on-one. -on -one. I'm going to come and say you're going to hear things that may be troubling to you, but, but even if you had an effective one-on-one -on -one approach, you couldn't, it, you could not, you didn't have the labor force to handle the problem. And that's, that was a practical issue. You had a big problem and how many trained therapy, even if you, even if they knew how to do this, even if they can in fact produce positive change or help the individual make a change in their lives. He didn't have the labor force for that. These, these kinds of factors that you need to understand that were essentially exercising influence on the development of a system, which had to be a mass system. We've got to treat a lot of people. And we've got to treat them quick and get them off the streets <coughs> and so on. And that's one of the reasons that the criminalization came in, because there was crime on the streets from them, but it was also a very convenient way to get a lot of people off the street. And, and it's one of the influences, the kind of uh, underlying influences around the, crim the criminalization policy that took hold. It wasn't simply the crime, but it's a good way to get a lot of people, you understand, uh, out of the way. And that's one of the reasons that Pharmacological approaches, methadone, which was in 1964 and 65, an experimental drug that has had not been demonstrated yet to be particularly effective, was still in the kind of experimental stage. 
but policy was, the call was too urgent, so they got it out and began giving methadone long before they <coughs> knew what the long-term effects would be. So the, the key proponents of methadone pharmacological treatment, that was the only really pharmacological treatment, the key proponents of that were very, very fine workers. Vince Dole, who developed it, and Marie Swan, who advanced it, she, she was a psychodynamic psychiatrist, both at Beth Israel Hospital in New York. They knew that it was not only going to be methadone, they needed that. The idea then, the way the policy kind of advice was, methadone was to get them into the clinic so that they're not on the street hurting other people, hurting themselves. And then once they're in the clinic and regularly stabilized on the methadone, then other services need to be available, social and psychological services. They can start working on somehow some of the issues of their lives. And that was pretty much an explicit view. Unfortunately, as uh, over the subsequent 10-year period, let's say 65 to 75, the, the methadone industry expanded rapidly because uh, there was a need for that, they thought. That was for opioids, not other drugs, but just opioids. And that expansion itself re-encountered the issue of, well, wait a minute, if you've got to now start delivering more services, if they need more social psychological services, groups, one-on-one -on -one counseling, and, and all kinds of planning for them, it starts to get expensive, and you also don't even have a labor force for that. And then regulations in the U.S., in terms of regulating how much methadone and so on, you gradually saw a decline, at least in the U.S., of methadone, not, not in terms of its widespread use, it became widespread use in the treatment of choice for heroin addiction, but it, the a range of services that were provided began to decline. So the whole methadone modality began to decline to a, a dispensing modality. That's the actual history in the USA. I think there may be parallel histories here. Well, you need to understand that. There's nothing wrong with methadone, but its original intention was really a harm reduction one, if you want to use the current language of that. Get them off the street so they don't hurt themselves, you know, stabilize them in terms of a medical management. We have them now. We can medically manage them so they're not running around and hurting people and stealing money to get illegal <coughs> opiates and so on. That was sensible. It did save lives in that, in that respect. That was sensible. But early, as I say, and I'm repeating this point, the view was, we still had a view among the original kind of medical establishment who understood the possible limits of methadone. They said, well, but these clients are going to need a lot more than the methadone. I think that's a very, very important historical point that now needs a kind of a renaissance. Because in that understanding of at least pharmacological treatment, that early understanding that it might be a limited treatment, even almost at the policy level, because they did try in the beginning, you know, you saw groups and you saw counselors really delivering clients, pulling clients into kind of social psychological services to the, to the best they can do that. And then the gradual disappearance of all of into a, basically a dispensary. Now, here's the point about that. It's a, it, it's, a, it's a compelling one that I have been gradually making clear for myself and then gradually teaching this in the field. You know, when you, when you, you, you begin, let's say, a clinic, and the clients come into the clinic and they ask, what, 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 what am I going to get in this clinic? And you go, what, are you going to get methadone? And then you're going to get this service and that service and so on. That's one kind of an environment that a client sees. And then, if that client who's coming in also sees in that environment, hey, I see now people who are active heroin addicts on the street, who are now doing better and better, as a result of whatever they're getting here at the clinic, both they're, they're getting kind of pharmacologically stabilized with the methadone, but now they're beginning to work on their lives and they're looking better and better. That picture began to fade. So if you walked into, as I did, in a very big, large clinic in Queens in New York 
700 methadone clients being served in that clinic. Now, 20 years, 15 years after that clinic was established, what you saw was methadone clients coming in the morning, getting, getting their methadone, and there'd be some things on the wall where they can go, <coughs> some indications, referrals about if they wanted this or needed help for that and so on. But basically coming in to get their methadone, and then either hang around outside or leave. Some, some went to work. Most of them, we don't know where they went. And that means they did not see other methadone clients at any later stage of recovery. And gradually the staff in those clinics, like this clinic I'm describing, it's now 15 years later, you don't see recovery. So if you walk in, it's like walking into a, a particular clinic <clears throat> tubercular clinic where you never see people getting over tuberculosis. You only see people who are always symptomatic. <coughs> That's where we're at, really. You may be there. When you, now, here's the point about this. The conclusion was, well, you, of course, you have a chronic relapsing disease. This was one, in my view, one of the unfortunate conclusions in the evolution of a very useful and important treatment, the pharmacological treatment in its place in opiate addiction. But instead of essentially having a particular place in the treatment, and in the, let's say what I would think the recovery of the client, what we finally had is a, an industry which was pretty much convinced that he was simply dealing with a chronic relapsing disease, which now probably has brain understanding to it and nerve. And this very strange sociological development that the longer you, the, the, the longer you keep, keep simply dispensing without essentially doing anything else with the client, you gradually reinforce the, the view and the philosophy that you've got a chronic relapsing disease, you can't get well. So the counselors, the nurses, the clients, well, we don't change, we can't get well. And kind of convince each other that's what we have. Well, look, that's one of the things I saw. I, I, my work in methadone has been very minimal because as some of you may know, I was on the other side of this. I, I began in therapeutic communities, which were drug-free approaches at the same time in the mid-1960s. So I'm a psychologist by training. I was never an active addict, although as a jazz musician, I knew it from that end of the universe. I, mean, I saw it long before I was a professional in psychology. So when the epidemic was flourishing and methadone was being dispensed and so on, which was a good thing, we thought, well, okay, there's a certain amount of harm reduction, even though I didn't, I, it was, I was never favorable toward it, I have to admit my bias on that, I was never favorable toward it, but I had to accept that there are large numbers of clients that are simply, this is what you had to do for them if you're going to help them at least save their lives. But at the same time, you had therapeutic communities emerging. And I was associated with one of the large ones and one of the, I think, very, very important ones, Phoenix House in New York City. But there were a, a number of them. The first one was Synodon in California, which was kind of the birth of therapeutic communities. You need to understand something about that, just as educated workers. You know, there's, there's a lot of misunderstanding about therapeutic communities, in some cases, stigma about that. And it, I, I, that's got to be cleared up just as part of your education, not to satisfy my bias. Just, as, just so your education is right on that. <clears throat> you gotta remember that these programs, the therapeutic community approach, were developed by the clients. You gotta think about that. So right away, I mean, that was, that was the usual beginnings of every one of the great programs. Here in England too. In the United States, which is the model for this, like Phoenix House One is just an illustrative example of this. You got seven guys on, on Beth Israel, the hospital I was just talking about, on the methadone maintenance to detox ward. They were going to be detoxed. And now when they're going to get out, this is a real story, they're going to get out, they were anxious. 
with detoxing, they all knew right away their reflex is what we're going to get out and it's going to be trouble. And they didn't want to go back to the street. Well, what are we going to do? So they stayed together. They had heard, a, they had a visit from a Puerto Rican psychiatrist by the name of Efren Ramirez, who had, was running a residential program with a, some addicts, Puerto Rican addicts in, in Puerto Rico. And he came up with one of the graduates of that program and had, on the ward, and gave a little lecture on the ward to these, to these guys. That was like three months before they were leaving. Then when they were ready to leave, they remembered that lecture. They said, this guy was talking to us about you know, some kind of residence of therapeutic community. On the basis of that, I'll shorten the story, but it is a compelling story. They pooled their welfare checks, as rented an old tenement in, on the west side of New York in a drug-infested neighborhood, which is all they can afford. And they began to build a drug-free house. No doctors, no psychologists, no social workers. They did that. And quickly the word got out in that neighborhood. There's a place you can go and get clean. Just imagine that. It's a house you can go to and get clean. So, so the word on the street was for those addicts who somehow got to some point wherever they were and were receptive to the idea of getting clean, and they knew, and what the part of also that, that rumor that was going around was it was not a hospital, it was not a jail, it had nothing to do with, it was not a school, it had nothing to do with any institution, it was just a house. So they, within like three months, there was 80 people in that house. Five stories. And then of course, what was going on in the house was, the abiding issue was, they were all afraid, they were all trying to make a change, they weren't clear yet where it was all going, but they knew they didn't want to hit the streets, and they didn't want to go back to where they were. That's what they really knew. I, I don't want to go back. I don't know where I'm going, but I, I know I don't want to go back. And it's on that basis, that mutual understanding, that they began to work out the daily living rules and practices of what's going to keep us clean and what's going to keep us essentially from going back. The entire technology or methodology of the therapeutic community, this is not a training in TC. I would hope at some point you might expose yourself to such a training, but that entire methodology of the therapeutic community was developed on a day-to-day -day basis, trial and error, in that 24-7 living situation of that first generation of participants. That was going on in Chicago, it was going on in Florida, it was going on in Philadelphia. That's, you talk about movement, that was the, what they'd be, the therapeutic community movement. We didn't even use the word recovery. It was simply all about change. They were talking about change. Recovery was a medical term, so they weren't drawn to that. They didn't even like the idea of words like disease. You know, they just, they just, they, they, in, in kind of in humor, they would talk about themselves as being crazy and acting crazy. You know, I'm sick in the head. I got sick thinking, all of that. But they didn't really mean that in the in the kind of classical medical term. They, they kind of meant that as a kind of social psychological exchange. I lived. I was a crazy, wild. You know, troubled person. <clears throat> Everything, the basic activities and essential elements of a therapeutic community were developed there. For those of you that are interested, you know, there's a lot of writing on this, and you can look at my own writings, my own book, which I later then put together for the field what was really what we now call the theory, the model, and the method of the therapeutic community. So while it starts nativistically down on the ground by the participants themselves, People like myself who were also very much part of that early process, even though I got in there about six months after they started, I began to see, well, there were very clearly some principles that were operating, even though they weren't operating from principles. They were, they were simply doing a trial and error, but it turns out what they were doing made a great deal of sense in terms of the social science of everything. So that's been converted into a more classical formulation, the therapeutic community theory model and method, and this is not the course in that, but as I say, maybe that's another time. The reason this slide is up there 
again, aside from my bias to therapeutic communities and where my work has been, is because of that, that first paragraph. And that paragraph stands. That is, by that I mean I kind of challenge that to all other experienced workers in this field. That basically, the therapeutic community for addictions is one of the first formal treatment approaches that is explicitly recovery oriented. And AA and so on, had, and mutual self help had been around, but they never designated themselves, as you know, as treatment. AA does not say it is treatment, it says it is support, it's a fellowship. They're right. But they do not call themselves treatment, nor do they take any treatment money, as you know. But the therapeutic communities in the 60s, like the story I just gave, the early Phoenix House story, which of course influenced the development of Phoenix House here in, in England. That story, right, those first therapeutic communities, they knew right away this was part of the vitality of the movement. They didn't want to stay out as an alternate or be kind of a quiet fellowship or a quiet religious commune off to the side. They were saying very quickly in the first year, we're a treatment approach. Well, that's why the statement stands. But they're a treatment approach, which it's my language to say that they're the first that were recovery oriented because it was very clear now in hindsight what, whatever was going on in the 60s and 70s in therapeutic communities, it was all about recovery. And as you can see in a moment, uh, how they in fact influenced what I think is, is today's recovery movement. <coughs> Let me see if I can still operate this, go the other way. In the perspective of the TC, this is very important, this is why you'll see it. Pharmacological treatment originally had as its goals essentially getting the individual to stop using illicit opiates. That was the goal of methadone maintenance. Stop is illicit opiates. And they were succeeding in it. That was a success, successful goal. Even the psycho, later psychological treatments, CBT and MET and so, and so like that, they're all focused on mainly we want people to stop using drugs and handle their relapse better. And so, or get them into treatment like motivational interview, get people maybe into treatment. So their goals were very real but limited, pharmacological, and even some of this is contingency contracting, which is a psychological approach, which says if your urine is clean, you'll get an incentive and so on. The idea was to keep you clean in those other, but for the TC, the primary goal was recovery. Uh, and in fact, it offered, I later formulated what they meant by recovery, which was if you watch clients go through 18 months of those residential TCs in those days, it really meant, you know, the issue of being drug free, that was accomplished in the third, first 30 days. They were already drug free. And we used to say then, you know, now that you're drug free, now your treatment begins. That makes a very powerful point to an educated service provider system. They need to understand, you want to get a good handle on recovery? In this view, anyway, it was, well, first stop using. Then we'll get down to business. And everybody thought, oh, wait a minute, the whole problem was we, we can't stop. You know what I mean? That was the whole issue. We can't stop using. But these approaches were saying, of course you can. If you get here, you know what I mean? You may go, some of you may have to actually detox while you're here and go through 10 or 15 uncomfortable days. But we'll help you do that. Peers, you know, we've all done it, we'll, we'll help you do it. But then from there on out, then the real work begins. And so that essentially morphed into a real goal, a definition of recovery that comes out of at least the therapeutic community experience. You don't have to buy it, you don't have to accept it, I'm not selling today. But it is lifestyle change and identity change. That's a big goal. They knew, go back to that original story, 
<clears throat> I think this story can be retold down at the train station with seven other addicts that you and I talked to. They knew that the real issue for them was a whole lifestyle issue. It was not simply their, their addiction. Their addiction was painful and troubling and essentially contributed to great disorder in their life. <coughs> but if anything was going to change, it was going to be that their lives had to change. Which implied a lot more than <coughs> simply that they are addicted. They had to change a lot of things about themselves. Now, again, I kind of regret, and, I'm, and you have to forgive me on this, because I'm still trying to fuse what we really know from the science of uh, change in, in addiction change and now the recovery movement the real work that's involved if you're really in, invested in recovery the real work that's involved in that and that's grounded in that phrase the real work is really grounded in what we really understand about what the disorder was at least as we learned it in, in, in therapeutic community experience and that which is not, I think now more general experience and that disorder is much beyond the issue of the fact that the individual continues to use drugs. They've got a disorder, as the TCs began to talk about, and as I began to write about, a disorder of the whole person. You had to change the way they think, you had to change the way they behave, how they handle their emotions, attitudes had to change, values had to be learned or unlearned, spiritual issues had to gradually be encountered. This is what those old long-term TCs in their own kind of primitive trial and error way were, were dealing with. That's what they were working on. When they were sitting in groups every night and talking to themselves, when they were working their job functions during the day in the program, they were really working on the issue of recovery, of changing people's behaviors, attitudes, values, emotions. They got that point. I happen to be convinced that that is the case so that the entire drug treatment system has been misguided when it's got down to the issue of only, you know, you gotta, you gotta get off drugs. Or you gotta get them into treatment. Those are, those are good, they're worthy goals, but it's, they're not sufficient. They're necessary, but not sufficient. And watch this. It's not simply services. It's not that they lead a lot of services. That's another thing that has essentially kind of intoxicated the, the, the policy makers that they need a lot of services. They do need services. I said you're going to hear things you may not like. But here's what we've now learned. If you're really watching long-term recovery, as some of us have been able to do through research over 7 and 12 years, you begin to see this one, and, and the rest of our day after I get through this long introduction is going to be on the recovery stages. But you watch that process of recovery unfold you really begin to see that the idea of services, housing and employment, they're absolutely relevant. There's no question about it. You can't, you can't get back into society and not have a place to live and not have a job. We know that. That's not the issue, the delivery of services. The issue is preparing the individual to use those services constructively. Every addict will tell you, I need a job, I need a house. If all you needed was a job, you wouldn't be here. Your problem is not getting a job, your problem is keeping a job. And that phrase exemplifies, hey, a lot of things have to change in you before you can be confident that you can go out and not only get a job, but keep a job. A lot of things have to change for you to be confident to do that. They can change. So when we, in fact, get into a service model, which we have been for 35 years, they're needed, that's good, but without a kind of sophisticated understanding of the disorder and the recovery process, we waste services. And we have. Everybody talks, the one of the reasons we have a great expense discussion in drug treatment policy is that it's very expensive. The whole drug treatment system can get very expensive. And then they foolishly think, well, residential treatment is more expensive, it's foolish. What they're missing in their understanding is that we do not, we are not guided by what we really understand about the disorder itself and recovery. 
you're, you're, you're hearing, of course, a little bit, a lot about the, the therapeutic community. But again, it's not to promote the therapeutic community, but it is to give you a kind of what I think is a proper <laughs> historical introduction to the recovery movement. There was always AA for alcoholics and gradually NA, but essentially uh, the recovery movement, as we understand it, while that was essentially the first, what we would call the first stage of a movement, when AA appeared, it rapidly spread and still does, and it has movement characteristics to it. And you're right, it's a very powerful support approach. But from a treatment perspective, the TCs essentially became a, a, a TC movement very fast uh, in terms of its rapid uh, spread across the world, as a matter of fact, and in, in, in virtually every country. And the fact that it was and is an approach that is strictly <coughs> recovery-oriented. That's what they do. And, and what I'm saying is there's been a great deal that we've learned from, uh, certainly I've learned, from the therapeutic community in terms of recovery. And on that basis, I have my work, for those of you who may know something about it or my interest, is not simply the therapeutic community, although I think it's an absolutely essential component of every sensible recovery system. <clears throat> the real work now is what did we learn from phenomena like the therapeutic community, like what did we learn from AA, what have we been learning about recovery, and then how do we essentially get that learning formalized and then finally get it to essentially guide a sensibly implemented drug treatment system? What did we learn about recovery and the disorder? And how do we get, I'm repeating that, and how do we get that implemented to guide the system? The system today in most of, in the US, I think in here too, has evolved. That is well, at least we see it as a health problem and, and we. We're, we're not necessarily just mindlessly punishing addicts in some moral way, you know, that's an advance. And we're offering varieties of services and help in any way we think is sensible. That's all good, it's humanistic, it's humanitarian. But we're at another stage, if it stays at this stage, we're simply we've got a lot of service providers, we've got a lot of people doing different things, and we're, we're trying to give them this and give them that, whatever works, this will do that. That's a chaotic stage of a system. That's not a system, that's simply a, a, a loose aggregate of provides, providers with different parochial views <coughs> of what they think addiction is and what they think recovery is. The science begins to tell us, no, no, we, we got a good idea now what recovery is. And we have a good idea about what it is we have to do to really promote recovery. We, don't, we may not be successful doing it, but we have a good idea doing how to do that. And so what you're hearing from me on the kind of missionary side is that a good understanding of recovery and then how that understanding of recovery should change the system. So there's a lot of implied threats in a presentation like this because it says, you know, the system has to change. It doesn't have, maybe, maybe it doesn't have to change all at once, but it does have to change if it's really going to benefit from recovery and we're in the first stage of that change. The positive view that of recovery as a concept which is now rescued after 35 years of addiction as a chronic disease. <clears throat> That's movement. So I'm not negative on this. We're moving. My concern is, are we going to move in the direction, and this is my arrogance, which would be the right direction, which is to pull the whole system together, folks, together, so that it's operating in kind of a continuous <coughs> framework to promote recovery. No longer interested in your opinion of recovery and his opinion of recovery and that opinion of recovery. We've got a good idea what that is. We've got a good idea of what the disorder is. And where the individual is in that recovery process has to be identified and then at which place will they go to to further promote them to the next stage in their recovery process. That's an integrated system. So the two messages of today, we may not get through it all, that's usually my problem, is one, to get a better understanding of recovery, usually, and the, and the one way I tried to do that was to create 20 years ago a stage framework on that. It's not the last word, it, it, it may be the first word, but not the last word. But a recovery stage framework. How to look at 
recovery over time. And that, that, incidentally, that framework has emerged from both clinical experience and long-term research outcome studies. So we have an idea about what the recovery process looks like. And we can even kind of identify clinically where individuals are in, the, in that process. Then the system has to say, OK, now that I have a good idea about where they are, what is it that we need to do to move them to the next stage? So I'm going to quickly just make this, this slide only to make the point that the contributions that I'm, that I'm going to, the main one we're going to talk about today is the recovery stage framework. That's the one that I want to, I want to basically leave you with. And, and I'm not sure we'll have enough time. But the two last bullets are the ones that I've been emphasizing here. The reason why I say these are contributions from the therapeutic community, even this one, is because, and watch this for the policymakers or commissioners in the room or whoever, the long-term residential TC, when it was properly run, inherently understood that what today we would call the recovery process was not a three-month process. It was not a four-month process. It was long. We didn't know how long. As a matter of fact, the first graduates in the first therapeutic communities, they might have been there 34 months, 35 months. In Synanon, which was the first addiction TC in, in North America, they never got out. The rule was, you know, you don't go out to the outside world. You just live here. That's one of the reasons Synanon went down, uh, took a wrong turn. So the time issues were never clear, but they, we knew that they were not short. And the way we knew that is by simply following, the way the early TCs knew it, Following the client, if they were really invested in the program, the treatment that they were getting in the therapeutic community, they were able to essentially measure each other's change as they were going, where they were, how stable they were, how real they were, how much attitude changed, how much have they grown, whether they use the word growth, how much growth have they shown. So they were able to kind of intuitively and then finally explicitly measure whether somebody was changing. Hey, you're ready to grow out now, maybe look for a job. You're ready to go out and look for a job. That whole phase, what we call early reentry, was a major recovery stage phase, major clinical issues. Client now clean for a period of time, stable for a period of time, now going to look for a job. Ask the resident, they think that's all I needed is the job, right? And having the peers and the staff that then existed assess, uh, is the individual ready? They really meant. Has there been enough attitudinal change, enough kind of emotional management change, thinking change, to reduce the risk for this client when they start to engage in the frustration of looking for jobs? It's an exquisite clinical point. Everybody should know that. When is this client really ready to look for a job? They'll say, all I need is a job. You're saying, all you need is a job. But again, folks, if vocation cured addiction, we wouldn't have criminals in the prison system. They've got very elaborate and sophisticated vocational training in prison. People have been getting that for 75 years. That didn't even reduce crime that much. The reason was, not because there's anything wrong with the training, the client hadn't changed it. Are you with me on this? I, this is a serious point. <coughs> so the stage, that long stage framework, program stages in the therapeutic community became for me the model of a system. Namely, uh, the issue of seeing, assessing where the individual is clinically <coughs> as they're changing by others, mainly peers as well as staff, but mainly peers, that's another big fundamental that comes out of this. And, and then at some point, the individual can then move maybe to even another setting. For example, the graduates of therapeutic communities have been there two years. <coughs> so we would now say to them, you've been here two years and you're graduating, now you're ready for psychotherapy if you want it. You came in a character disorder, you leave a neurotic. That means in a serious sense, well, you're now at a very low risk to start acting out with drugs and crime and so on, because a lot has changed about you. And as you see those changes unfold, emotional issues, depression, anxiety, other psychological issues have 
individual emerge, and now they're like the rest of us. Now you're like the rest of us. Now you've got to deal. Maybe psychotherapy can be helpful to you. But you're no longer a threat, you know what I mean, to be running out and, and, and doing bad things and hurting yourself. You're going to live like a citizen now. That means you'll be troubled. And if you have trouble and aches and pains, you've got there are places to go, which was the real place for real psychotherapy then. How to in, help the individual maintain a recovery status. So it's based on that stage program stage model of the long-term TC, uh, which essentially uh, provides, I think, a very good historical precedent for how do we advance that to a system-wide approach. So this slide essentially gives you the background for what I, what I want to talk with you about. And what I'm hoping you will, well, I have two objectives. I want all of the workers, the line workers who are here, to get a better understanding of recovery. And not simply a kind of um, exuberant spiritual understanding, but the real hard work that has to go into helping an individual change a lot about themselves so that they become essentially independent people who can manage their own lives. That's really the lifestyle identity change. So that's for the line worlds, but for some of the policy people, program design people, funders, I don't know whether they exist in this room, but even if they don't, you can echo it. What I want them to hear is, is that what we now know about recovery, the disorder recovery, uh, and what we know now about staging should really totally <coughs> provide the total framework for any policy drug treatment system. How do I now redesign the drug treatment system to deal with the phenomenon that we're, we're working with? There's some language now to help you get into the issues of recovery. <coughs> You can see, see the top bullet says, it's a definition issue. Top bullet says, recovery, strength, that's the medical terms. I mentioned to you, historically, we didn't use it in the first 10 years at all. We gradually came to use it when, when the, the medical and mental health system insisted on that kind of language. That's the way they understood this. And if you're going to talk about addiction as a, in quotes, a disease, TCs went along with it, as did AA, go along with all of that because that essentially brought it back to the mainstream, right? So if you talk about it as a disease, now it's at least a mainstream health issue. And so the words recovery, like the words disease, came into, came into use. Of it. But look, when you look at the word recovery, it's very simple. Look at it. It says, in the medical definition, is really overcoming, overcoming a disease. Watch it. That doesn't say chronic disease. It says overcoming a disease. That's, that's the medical definition of recovery. When people recover from cancer, the evidence is there's no disease. That's the evidence. It doesn't necessarily make the statement that you, it could not reoccur, but it says you've recovered, there's no disease. This subtle distinction is very powerful because the implication in the addiction field is that a chronic disease was you're con kind of continually reoccurring. It will never go away. So the, the word recovery would not have any place, anybody who believed you had a chronic recurring disease. Chronic, that's, that's essentially uh, the synonyms. But actually, in terms of the medical terms, you overcome something. Now, I've essentially solved that issue of what's chronic and can you overcome. And the answer is, you can have a chronic disease, for the moment I'm going to throw the word disease out in five minutes, but for now, a chronic disease, a disease could be chronic, but that doesn't mean you cannot recover from it. So you can, that is, and you can show all the signs of recovery. That is, is there any evidence today of that disease? We certainly can get to that criteria. Once you really understand the disease, which I'm later going to keep talking about as a the disorder, once you understand that and say, well, are there any real signs of the disease or the disorder? Once the individual is not showing what they showed when they came into treatment, you'd say they recovered. I fuss about this. I'm going to tell you why. I learned from the, the methadone dispensing phenomenon. 
what is the message, the accurate message that I want to give to a struggling, often desperate client who's coming into treatment or shows him or herself? What's the message I want them to hear? Is the message you have a chronic disease, which translated means you'll never get over this, so you have to keep. I don't want to give that message. The reason I don't want to give that message, one, is a, it's a little bit painful to give it anyway. Even if it was absolutely true, it's a hard message, right? It's like Tom said, so they have a terminal disease. So do I want to deliver that message? Well, if I have to deliver it because it's absolutely true, then I've got to do it. But we don't know if it's absolutely true. We, and in fact, even in the early days, in the early 1960s, you still had people who recovered without treatment. We had examples of recovery. Why am I telling this out if you can't recover? When there are examples, we don't know how many. We, we don't even know what proportion in those days we did. So I have a real problem, and had a real problem with the message of that, you know, in terms of, uh, am I want to deliver that message, or do I want to deliver a message that even if I want to hold to the language of chronic disease, you have a chronic disease, but you can recover from this. It's possible. The answer is yes, it's possible. Yes, there's been a lot of relapse, you've been in and out of this, and so on. we got that. But you can recover. I don't know how, you know, I don't know what the odds are. I'm not going to give you a, a surefire shot, although now later you'll see that in fact we can stop talking about some kind of probabilities. Because we know a lot about this now. So that's just to kind of alert you in terms of the term recovery. I'm going to shift uh, the way I've tried to influence my colleagues back in the States, but I have not been successful yet, is that we should shift from the word disease and replace it with the word disorder. And the reason I'm arguing that is because the word disease has all these implications. It's in the brain, it's in the physical. And there are brain, and there are, there's a biological aspect to everything in life. There's no psychology without biology. So they don't, it's, no, it's not news to say that the brain is affected by drugs, or the brain is involved in drug I got that. The question is, should we insist that it's all disease in the brain or in the nervous system or in the receptors, and that's it, and therefore, it's only when we can cure that that you will be cured, and we can't cure that yet. So you're finished? Well, I don't know. For those who are very interested in understanding addiction through the brain, it's very exciting to look at it that way. My interest is on the, in terms of understanding addiction in terms of how we actually experience it. What do we actually see? We don't see a disordered brain. What we see is disordered behavior and thinking. That's what we see. Nobody can deny that, even the brain people. In fact, they use the disordered behavior to help them understand what's going on in the brain. When the light goes on here, or the light goes on there in the brain, they then ask the client, you know what I mean, whether it's an active addict or not. So you never see the brain functioning there, but what you do see is the, the disorder of their lives. The way they walk, the way they talk, the way they think. That's what we see is the disorder. <clears throat> not that there isn't a brain behind there, but that's what we see. So the issue is, in my view, if you talk about what is the problem, if you want to use the word disease, then it's a behavioral disease, but nobody uses that. I use the word recovery and the word disorder. Why? Because it's a label which immediately and accurately describes what we actually see in this client. Your thinking has been disordered, your whole life is disordered. Okay. These two words are very important, very important for any drug treatment system that's going to be sensible in terms of judiciously using its resources. If you don't understand the difference between rehabilitation, and, and the system doesn't because it calls every place a rehab place. If you don't understand the, 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 the distinction between rehabilitation and habilitation, the distinction I made in 1979 in a talk at Yale, even there they were, they were still, everything was called rehabilitation. But that's not what we see in a lot of our people. A lot of our people, yes, have, have lived orderly lives, functional lives, then their addiction essentially disturbed their lives, and they got into trouble, and then they finally got into some kind of a bona fide treatment, like maybe a TC or something else for the moment, and they recovered. That word is rehabilitation, right? I'm gonna return you to a life that you once were functional in. 
rehab, right? I'm going to fix the life, you know what I mean, that you lost. The reason why that's important, it's not simply, you know, fussing with words. It has to do with issues like the client's resources. What we're hearing now in today, recovery capital. You hear a lot of issues about recovery capital. Where this individual is in terms of resources, money resources, psychological resources, social connection, uh, community, life, and family connections, and so on. Those people are most likely individuals who had some kind of functional lives for most of the, the, their adult life and then got into trouble whenever they got into trouble and, and lost it all. And now somehow they want to get reconnected to that and come back to it all. That's a rehab, but it also means a different client in many ways. Another thing a system has to know is, you know, wait a minute. Some number of people we are essentially designed, their recovery should really be more properly seen. The technology for that is a rehabilitation. Helping them get back to a life, you understand, that they can, that they maybe once lived. But increasingly, more and more of our clients coming in the system have never lived a functional life. That has never learned how to live right. Increasingly, at least in the USA we see that. I don't know what you're seeing here, but increasing numbers who essentially now come out of, you know, cycles of generations of addiction and violence, you know what I mean? They've been on the street from day one and increasingly don't really know what it is to really work or the values of work or even how to study. So it's nothing to do with necessarily intellectual deficit, but simply don't know how to do those things. So, and they, and they're addicted. So you say, what are we doing with them? And if many of them live criminal lifestyles to emphasize the fact that they've never really been fully socialized into the, into the mainstream. What do we do with them? Is that rehabilitation? I've argued, no. Why that, why I'm again fussing? Because the whole, if you like, the treatment technology changes if you understand the client. Got the addictive disorder there, I got that. But now I see, wait a minute, I got a client that doesn't know how to say thank you. And if that individual doesn't learn that, that's going to be a risk factor for them. If that individual is sim simply also someone who's getting, has no tolerance for any frustration, doesn't want to deal with any authority, no tolerance for delay of gratification, doesn't want to work, doesn't want to listen, doesn't want to study, what do we do with that? The addiction is there, but what do we do with that? In short, what you're hearing is that's a problem of habilitation, teaching individuals how to live for the first time. In the old days, in the 60s and 70s, they represented 20% of the addicted population. Most of it was lower middle class, middle class addicts who understood what was right in life but went wrong, you know what I mean? And then finally, uh, they gradually learned through the processes that I'm, I'm talking about historically how to get themselves right again. Now I want to, okay, I just want to be a citizen, want to get married, pay taxes, and so on. But increasingly, the generations are coming through. They don't, they don't, why do I want to get married? Why do I want to pay taxes? Why do I want to work? I see this a lot in the prison TC that, that I'm involved with now in these days. How to get a stake in life for the first time, which is not a deviant stake, right? By ripping and running. Are you with me on this, or am I alone on this point? I just don't know. Maybe this is a USA phenomenon, but that. So that's habilitation. But it, it makes the point from a teaching standpoint. This is what we're having today is a teaching, not a training. But from a teaching point, it makes this very, very important distinction that of carefully assessing who the client is, where they are in their addiction. And then the who part has to do with these issues of rehabilitation, habilitation. And as the recovery movement is learning, when they talk about recovery capital and so on, better assessments of the resources of the client to tell us what essentially they can best use in terms of interventions that would facilitate their recovery. That depends in part, in great part, on, on the resource level of the client. Why this becomes very important for, for drug policy is the habilitation and the serious rehabilitation. There is a subgroup in the rehabilitation group that has been seriously disordered. They had a lifestyle but they have long-term serious disorder also. And in terms of losing their whole lifestyle, the seriousness of the disorder is not only in the nature of how serious their addiction was, but in how far they dropped 
in their lives back into the street from a whole other level of living. You know what I mean? That group has been there. And rehabilitation is the word for them, but, they, and, but in many ways, they require an intensity of treatment to help them get back, if, it's going to, if we call them rehabbing them, uh, and the same way that the, that group requires an intensity of treatment to help them learn how to live. Are you with me on this? Very important. Why? For the system. The system doesn't acknowledge this. Then you're throwing, you're calling places rehab centers, you don't know exactly who you have in there. You don't know really, essentially, the extent of their resources to be able to use what you have in there. You may be, and this is the more serious, the more serious error in the system, under-treating. For large numbers of our people, they're not getting the intensity they need. I'm using the word intensity to describe, essentially, the array of, of input and the, what I call the treatment impact on them that they need. <coughs> And that finally translates into time and money. The paradigm that I use to capture this point is client <coughs> severity treatment intensity. Is the system in the USA, is the system in UK really driven by those two concepts? Do we know about severity? Do we understand it very well? Can we assess it carefully? And do we know about treatment in terms of intensity? What you're doing in your place, your place, your place, can you describe that in terms of low, medium, and high intensity? And if so, who are you doing that with? And carefully assessing the final question, do I have a good match between the severity and the intensity? Now here's the data on that. We now know from the large long-term outcome studies, mainly in the USA, but there is a, a, a very fine British study that Mike Gossip has run many years ago here, on this whole idea. Who does better in methadone? Who does better in long-term residential? Who does better in outpatient treatment? Outpatient treatment was seen as the kind of uh, light intensity. People who could go three times a week, you know what I mean, to a, to a clinic, go to work, go home, and so on. Presumably, those individuals were less severe, and the treatment was less intense, presumably. Methadone, it was severe, and, and essentially the criteria got vague, but it was those who didn't, want, didn't do well in other treatments, and finally they, they, it's going to have to be methadone. In long-term residential treatments, severe, even more severe than methadone. So we knew, and my own study showed this, and the national study showed, so these are facts now. They've got, got to put this in the bank. These are no longer opinions. And the facts are, you know, <laughs> clients who entered long-term residential treatment was a different client. They, they did it incidentally by, by, not, by their own selection. They gravitated themselves. They weren't necessarily put there, but they finally got in there. So you look at that profile. They had, their, their addiction history was serious. Their criminal history <laughs> was serious, more criminal history than the methadone clients and their psychological history was more troubled. So overall, their profile was the most severe in long-term residential treatment. The methadone profile was essentially a severe in addiction, but not that severe in crime. And then finally, the outpatient who looked more like a kind of middle-class addict, you understand that, who could still work, had community ties, but had serious, a serious addiction problem. It was even another modality, psychiatric in, inpatient rehab, they called it, psychiatric inpatient, three months in a psychiatric hospital, for a group of addicts who had severe addiction, severe addiction, but had actually, though, a positive lifestyle in addition. They hadn't, in a sense, they hadn't broken down into crime yet. They hadn't gone that far. But they were in a serious addictive state. That group went into a, 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 a modality which was called psychiatric rehab. You need this information if you want to Think about your own work in this. And then we found not only were these profiles different, but in fact, when you now looked at outcomes, which is what we did, one year later, two years later, those individuals, and you look at the whole modality and say, how many had favorable outcomes? 
you find the following. That the clients who were, who would be, whose profile looked most like long-term residential TCs, but who did not go to residential TCs because this was still a self-matching approach. I'm going to go where I want to go. What's ever available to me, this is very relevant for any treatment system. The client walks into a particular treatment service, and as we know, if you know the addictive disorder, the addict will most likely take the path of least resistance. So if you go into a, I'm going to give you a service, you come to this clinic, you come here, we'll do things for you, and the addict will convince himself or herself that, okay, I'm now in treatment, even though they're very severe, and they've got the whole profile that I just described to you in terms of, let's say, the long-term resident, but they put themselves over here, uh, you have an abject poor outcome for those clients. So if those clients go to this service, the data shows they don't do well. I'll leave out methadone for a moment because that's a whole other discussion. If the clients who are going to these, what we'll call the more moderate clients who are going to, who, should, who could do well in outpatient treatment if it's a bona fide treatment, who would do well in outpatient, but they didn't, but they wound up in residential treatment, they also did well. So that the clients who, in a sense, didn't, maybe didn't need that much intensity, but who actually went there anyway on their own, they had good outcomes. The issue there was they didn't really need it. We probably could have done it for less money. The clients who went to uh, the, what we'll call the long-term profile, severe profile, who went to the lower intensity treatment had poor outcomes. The two words that you want to get in, uh, in common usage now is undertreated, overtreated, sufficiently treated. That's the matching idea. Do I know enough about your severity to now start to make a judicious recommendation in terms of what intensity you need? The data now shows if you have enough of a grasp of that, you change the probabilities of outcomes if you're going to essentially engineer that match. That's a training, that's evaluation, that's assessment, that's not simply your intuition. System has to become very sophisticated and able to do that, be able to do that. That's part of the new world system now. Are we all on the same page about how we assess this client? Do we all agree that this client is <coughs> disavowed? Do we all agree that we understand the differences in services? Do we all agree that we understand the intensity of those services? The data now says, if we don't follow that, and then, then we're, we're back in chaos. We're, we're moving through either what's the flavor for the month, or the flavor of the, of the year. We already know now what we've got to do. We know something about the intensity of the disorder. We know something about the, uh, that is the severity of the disorder and the intensities of treatment. The therapeutic community has always been seen as the most intense treatment. And it was, at least even in terms of time alone. The client had to put a lot of time in there, but of course, it is the most intense treatment in terms of its, its, its approach, which is we deal with the whole person. You know what I mean? So we're really, a lot of things are happening for that client 24-7 over some period of time, but for good reason, which has to be reinstituted here in the UK and anywhere else. If you don't have an option for the most severe clients, you're doing nothing for the system, you're wasting a lot of money. If you think you can undertreat those clients, you're simply in defiance of the data. I just want to make sure the message is heard. You know. A little bit of a preach there, I got that, but uh, we'll take a little break, right? Again, this is informational, uh, and it has to do with what we know about outcomes, which are recovery outcomes. And, uh, and, and of course, we hear a lot about recovery from anecdotally. We hear you know, from, from person to person, but uh, we do have 40 years of research which has looked at the issue of recovery, even though they didn't use the word recovery, but they looked at the outcome status of a client who had been in treatment for some period of time, and then assess the outcomes usually in terms of the hot variables. 
any drug use, uh, any crime, are they fully employed, are they paying taxes, and even psychological changes, have they shown less depression, less anxiety, and so on. So there are long-term studies that have looked at recovery, or at least some of the critical components of recovery, indexes of recovery. And you need to know that information. I mean, that's, uh, that should be part of your own professional scholarship. You know, if you're doing work in this field, you should, without being researchers, you don't have to be researchers to get this. In the case of, of course, my work has been in therapeutic communities and looking at those outcomes. I can, I can tell you about the methadone outcomes also because I know them all, you know, secondarily to this. And there's a major, major UK study by Michael Gossett that was done through the 90s and, and reported in many, many papers. Uh, NTOR, I guess, N-O-T-O-R, the NTOR. So that was a massive study. He's been, and he modeled that after the U.S. outcome studies. And they look the same. There have been over 40, let me give you, give you an idea, at least for looking at therapeutic community outcomes, because that's the one modality that was kind of recovery. Of. And uh, if you just kind of summarize those studies, just in the field effectiveness, field effective means means Number of programs, let's say TC, long-term residential TC program, look at their admissions coming through, count the numbers coming through, and then take samples of those and follow them out. If you bring those, collect those samples together, as I did, and looked at all these studies across 20 years, they probably followed upwards of seven or 8,000 people that were followed out to 12, anywhere from one to 12 years out. So thousands of people have been followed. Through the, through the process is what I'm getting at. And then there are other sources of data that we looked at to establish uh, what might be the, the right findings. And it's summarized here. So they're from multiple sources of research, mainly the, the field effectiveness studies. Some from field effectiveness means we looked at many programs together. But then there were some single kind of special programs like Phoenix House studies, or the Gateway studies, Daytop studies, and so on. Uh, single program, and then some controlled, with, you know, typically randomized controlled studies, not many of those, and that's been a criticism of the research, uh, but hold that criticism in check for the moment, and then some statistical ways of looking at it. Here's the conclusion that is the takeaway from that, it's in that sentence, that the weight of the research from all sources co is compellingly supports the hypothesis that the TC, but don't worry about the TC, it has to be about the TC here, but we're really talking about, we, we're talking about recovery <clears throat> as an effective and cost-effective, because there have been a number of cost-effective studies done with this, for certain subgroups of substance, substance abuses. This, the certain substance abuses <clears throat> are the, the serious high severity people that I talked about earlier. <clears throat> now what this means is, there's a second finding that relates to this, which is the critical finding. Most of the people who went through treatment, who were followed in these samples, <coughs> thousands, most of them did not complete treatment. You know, dropout is the rule in all drug treatment. Completion rates are essentially <coughs> relatively small in all drug treatments. Dropout, in fact, not only is dropout is the rule in all drug treatments, but dropout is the rule in, in most health treatments. We used to think it was only TCs, then we also think it's only drug treatments. <clears throat> we now know that it's, it's you, it, people uh, drop out or don't adhere in most health treatments. That is, they don't really complete the treatment as prescribed, if you like. <clears throat> While it's not in this slide, the finding is, as, as I first published in, in the Journal of Medical, uh, American Medical Association in 73, when we looked at <clears throat> one year and two year outcomes, people coming through, let's say, in this case, therapeutic communities, and define success, let's say, no drugs, no crime, fully employed, that was a single index of success, you found that there was a very orderly relationship between success, as I just defined it, and how long they were in treatment. <coughs> so the ones who completed the so-called graduates showed the best success rates, one or two years after treatment, uh, and that success rate in was around 70%. Uh, no drugs, no crime, fully employed, and so on. It's very, very compelling success. It, in many ways, it helped establish the whole modality in terms of its credibility. But then, if you looked at 
how long you looked only at the dropouts, who were most of the clients. Most of the people had dropped out. So the graduates represented a small sample of all of the admissions. But if you looked at the dropouts, what you found is an orderly relationship between success rates defined by the criteria I just mentioned and how long they were in treatment. So let's say in an 18-month program, graduates did best around 70%. Well, it's actually more than 75. At two years, it was 70%. At, at, at five years, it was 70%. At two years, it was 80%. <coughs> but then if you look at <coughs> the dropouts who had, let's say, lasted a year and then left, didn't graduate but left, their success rate was around 55%. Then if you look at those who lasted, let's say, somewhere between six and nine months and then left, their success rate dropped to, let's say, 38%. And then under six months, the, the success rates dropped even lower. So you had this very orderly relationship between time in program and outcomes. That finding that we published back then in JAMA that I just now gave you has now been repeated worldwide over some 35 years in every major outcome study ever conducted in drug treatment. Length of stay in treatment predicts success post-treatment. It was the single most consistent quantitative predictor of who would be successful or what would be the success rates. How long they stayed essentially predicted whether they were going to be, what the level of success would occur. So if they, if they finished, let's say, half the program, you had a certain success rate. If they actually completed the whole program, you had a, sec a success rate that was much greater than that. And it was a very old, it almost looked like a dose response function, like as if you were essentially increasing the dose of some medicine. The more you gave them, the better they were. Now I say, that finding has now been reproduced everywhere. So it's a kind of, it's, it's a law in our field. You probably were not very aware of it, but as a research finding, that's what we know. It's amazing to me that policy simply doesn't get a handle on this. Well, it did, for a long while in the USA, it, it had a lot of currency. <coughs> it's only when the, the, the funding madness took over, you understand, that they begin to simply ignore the finding. You know? and it's just, well, let's, let's do it another way, you know, let's push it in here for three months or two months. Watch this. If you're really talking about recovery, and you understand it in terms of kind of a lot, a whole person change, a lot has to change in this climate. Then you talk about treatment, and then ask the question, <coughs> treatment intensity, how much treatment do they need? The guideline is, look, we now know pretty much more is better. We know that. Uh, even if it's a crude way of putting it, you know, more is, is better than, than less. We could probably get much more precise around that. For example, in, in the therapeutic community research, the cutoff point <clears throat> that seemed to make a very significant difference, at least in the residential side of this, for this severe client, was around 14 months. That is, you. Uh, it, individuals who stayed longer showed more success rates, but the increment of change was getting smaller. So that it looks like if they got a dose of about 14 months, they got a, what seemed to be an effective dose in terms of producing a, a respectable success rate. But it was, if it was my son or my daughter that I was sending to that program, I would absolutely insist that they finish the program. Do it all, because that simply inch, increases the probability of long-term success. <clears throat> but if there was any scientific finding in the health field that was so clear and so consistent, this has been the great contribution of that finding, the health field hasn't even recognized it, because there are some health issues which have the opposite finding, it's the nature of the disease, you know. But in, in terms of uh, a, a number of health orders, but certainly drug addiction, all drug addiction, the longer the individuals invested <clears throat> in treatment, the better they do. We now know why that's true. We have a lot of good understanding of why that works that way. Uh, a, a lot of it has to do with the issues of motivation. A lot of it has to do with the issues of the individual, as you will see later, achieving a certain stage of recovery in the program. They don't get recovered in the program. They reach a certain stage of recovery in the program. That stage builds up a strong immunity to their falling backwards when they're out there. They've got to achieve a certain threshold of change, is what I'm getting at. And at least in the old days, that timeline, the old residential days, 
was around 14 months, which kind of gave you a very big push. The, the, the real emphasis was graduate, graduate the program because that gives you the best push. But the truth was, <clears throat> we did see dropouts who did very well, even if they didn't graduate. But that related to the fact that they were there 14, 15, and 17 months, and, and essentially got a good dose of that treatment. <clears throat> so there's a relationship between recovery and time and treatment, but it isn't that the time and treatment produces the long-term recovered outcomes. It's not that. It's that the time and treatment has got to be long enough to get the individual to a certain stage of recovery, so then when they go out beyond treatment now, they have built up a certain immunity, if you like, a certain preparedness to deal with the world, and their recovery could be sustained. Now, what I, the reason why I'm, I'm kind of emphatic about this, because this is the science of it. So when I hear about drug policy, basically not really, first thought, the first sentence out of drug policy mouths should really be, you know what I mean? Length of stay in treatment, the more involvement in the treatment, the better. Not getting into treatment, but you've got to actually get through treatment. The reason is you want to get them to a certain stage of recovery. You would think the science should settle on this and say, okay, the whole system has got to be grounded around that. So if I've got, let's say, severe clients, we know, and I would recommend their, their, for, their early recovery has got to be in a high-intensity treatment. And they've got to be in there some sufficient time. I now, and I don't want to spill too many beans here yet, but I now, if, I, if people want to write another check, I'll tell them some things, but, but I'm kidding on that, of course. But what, I, what I now would say is that we may not need 12 months of residential treatment if you're so afraid of pain with this, even though that all the data says a good therapeutic community of 12 months is going to save you a lot of money. They don't believe that yet, but they, they simply don't know the data. But if you don't want to go that far and you're, starting, you're working in a current climate of conservatism around money and bankruptcy and so on, then the issue is, well, could we restructure the system so that we guarantee the individual is, is getting a treatment impact, moving them in their recovery stage, even if it's not all in residential treatment? It's got to begin in residential treatment if we're talking about the severe client. Now that's the enlightened view. That's the one I would sell to the, to, the, to the policymakers because that's the one that will at least begin to approximate what the science tells us. You'll get good cost-benefit effects if you do that. You with me so far? Okay. So that's what I wanted you to hear from, from some of the research. Time and program, time and treatment. Incidentally, in methadone maintenance, you've got no good effects in the methadone maintained client, which is time and treatment. That's an outpatient clinic methadone. But they get their methadone, let's say, every day or other, every other day, whatever the schedule is. But if they, as long as they're in the methadone clinic, we saw that the, the effects of essentially reducing heroin use and other drug use and reducing crime didn't really uh, be, become very clear until the client was on methadone for about nine to twelve months. So even and you had dropout in the USA, the dropout rates were thirty and forty percent from the methadone clinics. So they were dropping out also, even even though they were getting methadone. Dropout rates in, in, in TCs were higher, but the reality of both pr approaches was that it's going to be time if they if they stay with that treatment, they're going to do better, even in terms of the methadone outcome. The methadone outcome is, is the individual continuing to take their methadone? Watch this. If you follow methadone clients after they stopped their methadone, they were in trouble if they didn't go into any other treatment. So at 12 months, the methadone clients do well in terms of reduction of heroin use, reduction of <coughs> other drug use. You've got to be there 12 months to do that. And then if they stay with their methadone, essentially if they're maintained on methadone thereafter, there is a, a real question in, in terms of uh, how well they, uh, they begin doing. If they, if they stop their methadone, they've got to stay on methadone if they're going to keep their opiate use down. But uh, if they drop out, if they stop their methadone, then, then they're in trouble again. So you get the relapse rates there. That's where all the dosage information and all the insistence, largely from the USA, for 
was that you got to put them on methadone, you got to put them on 120. Vince Dole wanted them on 120, even though the going rate was something 60 to 90 in many places. And you got to keep them there. And it was true. Once you have them on methadone, you understand, and, and, and essentially I'm maintaining them that way, uh, then you have, and, and then you're going to detox them, and they don't get anything else, then you're going to have a problem, you understand, in terms of their, of their relapse. But in the drug-free or the TC approaches, which start out as abstinent approaches, you drug free, you get drug-free early, and then you, you, you go through the whole program. And if you finish that program, uh, you see these good long-term effects. Un unfortunately, uh, people did not make the distinction between looking at effectiveness of methadone treatment for the methadone client and looking at effectiveness for the therapeutic community client. Profiles are similar, but except for the poorer employment and the higher crime rates among the TC people, look the same. And people would say, well, they, don't, they look very similar, particularly look at 12 months. And if the client stays on methadone, they look pretty good. And isn't that cheap, 20 cents a day or 40 cents a day? versus residential treatment, but you're looking at, you're looking at comparing apples to oranges. One, the profile is different in the two clients, A and B, and B, one treatment says you gotta stay in the treatment indefinitely, you gotta stay on methadone indefinitely in order to reduce that opiate use. We are, our success rates in therapeutic communities, we never reported success rates during treatment. Success rates during treatment which would be comparable to saying success rates while you're in something like methadone, which is during treatment. If you compare two during treatment success rates, the residential success rates were near 100%. There was very little use of drugs, no crime, while the client was in treatment. You had some dropouts went out and then they went. But if you stayed in treatment in a therapeutic community, you were not using drugs and you were not committing crimes. So that we never reported it that way. That's how naive we were in the early science days. We kept saying, oh no, real, real cure is when they get out of here, then we'll really see how they do. And we still believe that. But the issue was, politically, when we started to get compared, therapeutic communities started to get compared to other treatments, like pharmacological <coughs> treatments, they were comparing in-treatment people without post-treatment people in the, in the therapeutic community. So the success rates that I'm talking about here are one, two, and five years after the client left treatment. And what did they look like five years later? Versus, let's say, a methadone outcome, which is, was the client, it's been two years in methadone, they look pretty good in terms of their opiate use reduction and no crime, but they're still on methadone. So you're looking at it, a, a during treatment, continuing treatment with essentially a treatment completion. You don't complete methadone treatment. So that was an invidious comparison almost from the earliest days. And it, it was very worrisome. We still, I assure you, most of the policy world still doesn't understand that way because the inclination is to go to the cheaper treatment. And when you go that way, and they don't realize what they're really doing when they say that. Well, if I just keep them in treatment, okay, we've got less crime and less drug use, but, uh, and, it's, and it's less costly, and then you compare it to what I would call a recovery, which at first looks more costly, Incidentally, the only reason it looks more costly is the residential cost, not the treatment. The treatment is cheaper. When you separate out residential costs, accommodation costs, in therapeutic communities, and look at only the treatment, namely what we're actually doing in groups and meetings and so on, and it's mainly run, driven by the client with relatively fewer staff, and should be relatively fewer medical staff, fewer psychological staff, mainly the clients run it, Cheaper treatment. Every dollar and every dollar calculation shows that. It's another misnomer about residential treatment that it's more expensive. It's the residents that adds a cost to that. And I've always argued that the clients, these clients, severe clients, if they weren't in this residence, where would they be? They'd either be on the street, or they'd be in shelters, or they'd be in prisons. So what's the cost of those? So the taxpayer would have to pay it anyway. <clears throat> That's news to you, right, folks? It's a very, very important. Uh, these are the sophistications of the cost analysis that they won't get into. So we are now in terms of the recovery stage framework. I guess the slide jumped itself, didn't it? Did it, did it? 
I, I don't remember moving there, but that might be one of my senior moments. I don't know. Mm -hmm. The research, the clinical experience of providing the empirical basis for a descriptive framework of long-term recovery process. That's what I'm going to get into, the recovery stage framework. So the preparation for this part of the talk has been, uh, again, to kind of recount this. The real issue now, and the great issue, and I think the very exciting issue, is the increasing interest in the word recovery and the concept of recovery and what we're now calling the movement of recovery. What, what I'm hoping you hear from this talk is that, you know, we've got a literature and we've got a history that essentially can inform this whole movement. It's a, there's a timing issue in the evolution of drug treatment. And some of the issues as I've talked about, perhaps a little bit from the, the therapeutic community side, but I hope I presented a more or less balanced picture of the issues. Uh, we learn now from the research and uh, from the clinical experience, it's, it's now over 40 years, it's 40 years of research and clinical experience at least, which is now, it can inform what the whole recovery movement. If we've got a resurgence in belief in recovery, that's wonderful. Uh, I argue that if, you, if we really have an educated workforce, providers and so on, and they're an educated workforce, they really should be educated. They should really know what the history and what we know about all this. It's not all has to be reinvented, but it does have to be reconfigured. And so that <coughs> this is the real mission, and if we begin from that basis together, I assume now you have a little background from what I've talked with you about, we can then talk about two very important large ideas. One is the description of the recovery process in terms of a recovery stage framework. It's a way of simply describing what people look like from the clinical experience and the research and when you follow them out over years. We have, the, we, have the, we have essentially the advantage of doing that. And I would argue that some kind of a stage format, framework if you like, needs to be invoked to influence and guide the treatment system. It cannot be your definition of recovery, your definition of recovery, your opinion about what should work about recovery. It is true that there are pathways that people have taken to recover, different pathways. But that statement only means that on the surface of it, it looks like people would do <coughs> different things to get there. And even if you assume they look, two people look like they are both recovered people and they can share that, but their pathways look different, when you finally examine the pathways, you're going to see they underwent very similar experiences. So if they got to recovery, some through treatment, smaller proportions through natural recovery, about 22% are natural recovery, apparently without treatment. Apparently without treatment. But it doesn't mean that treatment essentially has all the ingredients to make recovery occur. It means there are ingredients that have to be there to essentially facilitate an individual's recovery. Many of them are in a very good treatment model, such as I think the TC model has many of those. But a number of those ingredients can be invoked in other settings. But those ingredients have to be there to facilitate. I think we know enough of what they are. And you'll, you'll see it as we begin talking about at least what the picture of recovery looks like. So I'm going to do a short version now. And then I want to see how much you can take on the, sh on the short version of what that recovery framework look really looks like. What this is, is essentially the brief version of recovery stages. If we were doing the training in recovery stages, each one of these would have a rather set of paragraphs underneath. But there'd be more to say about each of these. These, this, this, these slides are basically going to give you the kind of working definition of what we mean. And then I think maybe after the next break, I will go to the next slide and may, maybe get into more detail about the recovery stages itself, each of these stages itself. The second major objective is not only to finally get to recovery stages as a framework to guide what we, what we need to put together as a treatment system, but my last point would be what that system should look like. And uh, so it's, those are the two objectives that I have. 
let's get a better understanding of what we mean by recovery stages, and then we can go to, well, then what do we need, what would the system look like if it was really guided by recovery?